In just a few minutes, uh, we are going to be going through uh, Lecture Note 3, and also I posted into the file section of Bloomberg an Excel file called Conversion Video-101 Start. Uh, you'll probably want to have that open to kind of go along with what we're doing to help you with the economic conversion. So while you guys are, are working on those files, just want to let you know that Wednesday, uh, Bloomberg is coming back to class. Uh, they'll be here all day. And the people that are coming are going to be talking about how to use the Bloomberg terminal to do what's called the Bloomberg Trading Challenge, which we're going to do instead of stock track to do the investing and, and tracking it over time. So as I mentioned, I kind of actually decided to hold off on creating the groups because I didn't want some group to create their $30 stock track account and waste the money by mistake. So you're going to be put in the random groups and then they're going to teach you how to use the terminal because you have to do the trading through the terminal for your groups to basically start the process for what's going to be called the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. So work the same way. You'll be given a fictitious account of money. You can buy or sell equities and you'll be tracked on performance against your peers over time. So they're gonna come and talk to us about how to do that on each of the sections on Wednesday. So very excited to have them back. So uh, <clears throat> the other thing we're gonna spend most of our time on today is we're gonna talk briefly about your last homework assignment. And then, as I said, lecture note three and the economic statement conversion, which I said topic wise, will probably be a little bit more challenging for some of you. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a core topic for the semester that we're gonna to cover today. So let's talk about your last homework three assignment. So what you should have done is, in the equity screening tool, you had to create an equity screen. Okay, so first thing I asked is to go to the stocks 600 which is basically like the S&P 500. So you should have found the Stocks Europe 600 price index. And if you're not familiar with the stock in Stock 600, and hopefully you now are, but basically it's the European equivalent of the S&P 500. So just as we use the S&P 500 in the US to track 500 large companies across industries, how they perform, the Stock 600 is the same thing, 600 large companies across industries in Europe. It's a kind of a benchmark for European big company performance. So increasingly, that index is being reported alongside the S&P for their version of Europe. So 600 companies in the Stock 600 index. They have sub-indexes as well. All right, so you should have done that. Second thing is you should have created two custom fields. <clears throat> uh, one was called Operating ROIC. And I believe we said that this one would be greater than, greater than, was it 15%? So that should have brought you down to 160 companies, right? And then the second criteria was expected growth more than 50%, 15%. So basically, you would have come over here to custom fields and, oh, sorry, you would have come over here to uh, formula and you would have created your own formula so you can click on fields to find it or you could have started creating it yourself. So the easiest way was to go to fields and we talked about using best sales. So best stands for Bloomberg estimate. So if you remember in the EEO screen where we have the earnings estimates that the analysts are projecting, that's what BEST is. So it's the Bloomberg estimates. It's basically a link to the consensus estimate part of Bloomberg where we're taking the analyst forecast for these companies. So these are the best sales. And for the period, we wanted to do a customized period. And we wanted to go to years ago forward. And we wanted Y plus 1. That's what I asked you to do in the custom formula. So when you use this formula, it would put that in. So again, it would be current year plus one minus, and then we would have gone to sales or revenue. Uh, so we take revenue for the latest year in parentheses 
and then we divide that by re revenue or sales for again the latest year. So that would have been the custom field you created for expected revenue growth rate. And then you would have saved and used that. Expect rev grow two. And then that would have brought you down to oh, greater than. And this one, I believe, because there was no multiplying by 100, would have been greater 15%, so 0.15. You just to check the, the nature of the field so that when you look at the number, sometimes you have to divide by 100 or multiply by 100 to put in the right percentage. But this would have been 0.15. Make sure you're doing an and, not an or. And that should bring you down to, if all is correct, 58 companies. Okay, so that would have been the solution. You click on see results. And this is the screenshot you would have taken and submitted. And the key here on the screenshot is in the top, even though you couldn't get everything on one screen, it would have said Investable Universe 58. So it would have actually told us that you got the right amount of companies. Okay, so that was basically the last homework assignment. Questions about this, what we did? Yes? Okay, did that get you to 600 companies initially? Okay. But it got you down to 58? Okay. I, not ideal, but close enough. But, but again, the, the most important things, I mean, you'll get credit for it because you got to the 58 companies. Uh, and for whatever index you use, there were eight difference and, you know, obviously didn't make enough of a difference to affect the outcome. But, you know, this is a make sure you have these fields right. So I would go back and adjust it just so you have it going forward. Because when we get to our group projects and we're using these fields and other homework assignments, that way if you have to use them again, it will, yeah, will work. Yeah, the index is less important than the custom fields. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. Then that's good. Yeah. But just in, in general, as I said, we're all getting familiar with Bloomberg. There's a lot of indexes in there. So, yeah. We'll, yeah. Okay. But you got to the 58, then, and that's what we'll get you credit for. Okay, good. Other questions? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> let's talk about, and then as I said, you'd have just saved, take screenshot, save the file, and same thing. Homework three. I did it earlier. Call it homework three solution. All right, so again, what the primary purpose of the assignment was was just to start to introduce the concept of custom fields, and those custom fields that we created are ones we're going to continue to use throughout the semester. Okay. So today, as I said, uh, we're going to talk about Lecture Note 3, Economic Statement Conversion. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is Medigliani Miller. And... <clears throat> The key here is that a company's worth the sum of its future cash flows, and the idea is <clears throat> we're going to separate those cash flows into operating cash flows and non-operating cash flows. All right? Operating cash flows are the cash flows that come primarily from selling products and services. It's what you do as a business. Right? Non-operating cash flows have value. They just have nothing to do with your sales. So, for example... Last week, Apple had some new product announcements. They're shipping this week. <clears throat> so if people bought a new Apple Watch, new iPhone, a uh, new Apple TV, that's operating. That's what Apple does. They, they sell products and services you pay them a lot of money for. But Apple also has something like $260 billion of cash sitting in the bank. Right? That has nothing to do with selling an iPhone. Right? It has value. There's a lot of value to having a lot of cash. So what we're going to do is we're going to value it separately. We're going to call that a non-operating cash flow, okay? So we're going to take the value of Apple, and we're going to have the operating value, how much they make by selling their products. We're going to have the non-operating value, things like cash that have nothing to do with their selling products. We're going to present value them both. We're going to add them two together, and that's going to be called enterprise value, or EV for short. And the primary reason we're doing this is in valuation. If Apple were to sell more iPhones, they don't have to 
borrow $240 billion worth of cash to sell the next $200 billion worth of iPhones. That doesn't make any sense, right? So what we have to be able to do is to forecast that the operating and non-operating assets go up at a different rate. So by breaking the company into these two pieces, it'll help us forecast and get a cleaner understanding of the value of a company. All right, so we're not ignoring it, we're just putting it into this format. So that gets us enterprise value. It is that enterprise value, which is the cash that is available to pay the investors, debt holders, interest-bearing debt, and equity holders. So debt is the primary claim. So the point is, if we take our enterprise value, pay off the debt, whatever's left goes to the shareholders. Matter of fact, divide by share, share price. That's the method for enterprise DCF valuation. It comes right out of Medigliani Miller. So that's what we're going to do this semester. Now, <clears throat> what's different or unique about this class versus any other finance class that you might have taken is that in this class, <clears throat> since we're mapping the statements to Medigliani Miller, then I'm going to use a mnemonic, which only exists in this class. So if you start using this mnemonic anywhere else, they're going to think you were cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? They're going to not know what the hell you're talking about. And the reason I developed this mnemonic is I used to teach in the McKinsey Analyst Training Program back in the day, and I used to have to, in less than a day, get people who were really smart, but they never took finance. Like, these were English majors or law students or pre-med students, and I had them to not only learn the accounting, but they had to learn how to do the conversions that we're about to go through. And so I had to come up with an easy way to help them to figure out what to put where. So what I started to do, and it's going to carry over to this class, I think it'll actually help you, is we're going to label each one of these Medigliani Miller boxes. So cash flow from operating activities, we're going to call box one or bucket one. Non-operating cash flows, twos. Debt cash flows, threes. Equity cash flows, fours. All right, so for each of those four boxes, one, two, three, and four. So one plus two, enterprise value. Three plus four, enterprise value. 1 plus 2 minus 3 equals 4, enterprise DCF valuation, okay? So that's the conversion that we're about to do, and to graphically represent this, that's what the next slide is all about. So what this shows you is the process that we're going to follow this semester. And again, what's different about this class, they don't teach you anywhere else outside of the Warden School, <clears throat> where one of their McKinsey people actually teaches, Dave Wessels, friend of mine, is actually one of the named authors of the book, 6th edition. But basically, what you learn elsewhere and what's used in the real world is what I call the direct method of cash flow valuation. You start with the statements, you go directly to the cash flows, you value the company. Here, we're going to add an intermediate step. All right, the intermediate step gives us a cleaner valuation and actually helps with the analytics. It's extra work, you're going to hate it, but you'll realize it actually is valuable by doing it after you kind of learn the process. And so the process is, we're going to take the accounting statements and we're going to map them into economic statements of Medigliani Miller. And there's three statements called the TFI, Total Funds Available to Investment, that's the rearranged balance sheet, TII, which is the rearranged income statement, Total Income Available to Investors, and CFI, which is the rearranged cash flow statement, cash flow available to investors. These are economic Medigliani Miller statements. Once we've done the CFI, the cash flow statement, we'll then use that to do the valuations of the company. So it's an intermediate step. So here's the point. The reason why we remap the statements, as I said, is it gives us a cleaner valuation, okay? And a more straightforward valuation. And you'll see that as we walk through this little flowchart diagram. Now, when we do the remapping and reconverting, it doesn't matter which statement you start with, the income statement or the balance sheet. You have to do both, right? But the ordering of the two does not matter. You have to convert both statements. What does matter is to do statement number three, the cash flow statement, CFI, you have had to do the first two, okay? So you can't do the CFI unless you have a TFI and a TII. But you can do the TII or the TFI independent of each other, and you have to do them first, okay? So let's start talking about the conversion. The first conversion, we'll start with the income statement, is to convert to total income available to investors. So what we're going to do, we'll practice this in just a minute, is we're going to take an income statement, and we're literally going to go through, and we're going to label every item on that income statement a one, two, three, or four. 
Now that is Professor Perfetti's process, the labeling process, because what it helps us do is we're going to map it to that Medigliani Miller statement. Anything that's a one, anything that's operating, it's going to go in the operating bucket. Anything that's non-operating in the non-operating bucket, <clears throat> anything debt, a three in the debt bucket, anything equity, a four goes in the equity bucket. <clears throat> the other metaphor I want to use is the Lego metaphor, which is if you ever played with a Lego toy and you ripped it apart and you put it together as something else, there can't be any Legos on the floor. All right? So all the Legos have to be reused. So when we rearrange these statements, we literally are rearranging them, and the rearranged statements still have to balance. They still have to foot. And if we forget to put in any accounts, they won't balance, they won't, won't foot, and that's an incorrect answer. So the other benefit of this approach is it means you're less likely to make a mistake. And here's what I mean. If you take the process that you've already learned to calculate free cash flow, you calculate free cash flow. But if you forget to put an item on the statement into the free cash flow calculation, you have no idea that you forgot it. And so the free cash flow looks right to you because you did the math. But by balancing it, by showing here's the cash flow I generated and here's where the cash flow was spent and showing that those two equal each other, okay, then you're less likely to make a mistake because if it balances, then you've accounted for all the items. If it doesn't balance, you haven't accounted for all the items. In the real world, people don't balance. They don't really account for all the items. And that's why I said it means you're more likely to have a pot probability of making a mistake. In this class, I'm not saying you can't make a mistake with a balance statement, but the probability goes way down. And that's what's going to be key to this class. And if you're going to hate me for this, but it's also key to your grade. So here's the point. In this class, for grading, and be very clear about this, to get a correct answer, you must have not only the right number, but you must have a balanced statement. If you have the, balance, the right number, but an unbalanced statement, you get a zero, you don't get any partial credit. Okay, So that's the point. You can't be lucky. Because if you have an unbalanced statement, then you know it's one of two numbers, and a 50% probability is not a correct answer. So therefore, in this class, you must balance the statement and you must show the balance statement along with your numbers in order to get credit on both your homework and exams. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's the point. Income statement. After we label all the operating items, we put them on there and that's going to end up being something called no plat. We'll take our non-operating items and that's going to be total, uh, sorry, non-operating income. We add those two together, and then we get something called total income available to investors, TII. It is that TII which is, can be redistributed to the financing of the organization. So the bottom of the statement is also called the financing or funds flow. So and this is where the balancing comes into play. So whatever TII I have, I then distribute to the debt holders, the interest expense, and to the shareholders, the net income. And that will be the balancing rearranged income statement. Statement two is the balance sheet. We will take the operating assets and we will net them against the operating liabilities and that will get us something called invested capital. We'll then take the non-operating assets and we'll net them against the non-operating liabilities. And there's not really a name for that, so we'll get the, the net of that. And we add those two together, we will then get something called TFI, Total Funds Available to Investors. All right? And that will equal to all of the debt, interest-bearing debt of the company, plus all of the equity of the company, the threes and the fours. And that will also equal our TFI. All right? And by the way, here's where you can start to see one of the quick differences that we're doing in this class. I asked you as part of one of your assignments to create operating ROIC. Operating ROIC is no plat divided by operating invested capital. Well, that's the point. In the rearranged statements, we have those two buckets already set up very cleanly. That's why in this class, if you don't read the book and you use Investopedia, because like, oh, I just use Investopedia, save the money and don't have to do any work, like you will fail this class miserably. <clears throat> because think about this. When we do invested capital, we don't just do current assets minus current liabilities. We do the current assets that are operating minus the current assets that are non-operating. So that's going to be one of the keys to this class, which is 
you actually have to take out things that are non-operating, so it's not all the current assets. You have to take things that are debt out of the current liabilities because it's not all a current liability. It's operating. So that's the point that will be initially frustrating but give you more clean statements. Now, here's the other thing, <clears throat> that the CFI statement is a cash flow statement, and cash flow is basically income statement minus change in the balance sheet. Because right, the balance sheet is a snapshot, and the income statement explains the changes between the periods. So I have balance sheet, income, balance. Okay, ba Income explains the two. So to do cash flow, I need to do income statement minus change in the balance sheet. We're going to do that process four times when we go through the CFI. In the operating cash flow, it's the cash flow from the income statement, the no plat, minus the change in the operating cash flows of the balance sheet, minus the change in the invested capitals, operating invested capitals, equals free cash flow, which is the operating cash flow of the business. The non-operating income minus the non-operating assets and liability change equals the non-operating cash flow. Add those two together, cash flow available to investors. It is that cash which can be paid out to the debt holders, the interest expense, and the retirement of the debt, and the shareholders, the dividends, share repurchase, and those will always equal. Okay, That's the balancing part of the statement. By the way, we forecast free cash flow, we get operating value. We forecast non-operating cash flow, we get non-operating value. You add the two together, get the enterprise value. And that's the enterprise value that's available to the debt and the equity holders. What's nice once we get into this format is we can actually do valuation and analytics both horizontally and vertically. Meaning, I can actually forecast total income available to investors and TFI to get CFI, and if I forecast my CFI, I directly get enterprise value, okay? So I can work across as well as up and down, right? And again, here's why this will matter, right, as we're doing our balance sheet analytics. In this class, what we call ROIC is not what Bloomberg calls ROIC, and it's not what you learned was ROIC in a previous academic class, and it's not what Wall Street uses as ROIC. What they call ROIC is actually <clears throat> TII divided by TFI because they're doing return on debt and equity, which means they're not separating out operating and non-operating assets. And I want to give you an example of why this matters. So here's Bloomberg. Three years ago, <clears throat> I was invited to speak at the top 150 conference for a company called Molson Coors at the Weston Hotel in Fort Lauderdale right on the beach. TAP U.S. Equity. And the reason I was invited to speak there will become fairly obvious. Go to RV and go to Custom. Their ROIC, Return Invested Capital, Customized Period, Years Ago, do Y-3, so this has been 2000 and basically 14 results. Hit update. You will see that the industry is making about a 15.5% ROIC and they're making about a 5% ROIC. If you do a current WAC and it hasn't changed all, ma all that much, what you will see is based on that ROIC, they had a negative spread. And the industry was doing much better. We're kind of like in a golden age of alcohol. And at the time, they were the only alcohol company in the world that had a negative five-year total return to shareholders. So if you actually, at the time, if you invested in Molson Coors, you actually lost money. And that was not good. Their stock price wasn't doing well. It's a lot of pressure on them from Wall Street. They had to improve their performance. What was ironic is if you actually went to the annual meeting of senior leaders of Molson Coors in February in Fort Lauderdale, it was like spring break at the beach except instead of a bunch of drunk 20-year-olds, it was a bunch of drunk 50-year-olds. Matter of fact, in the ballroom, they had these big buckets of beer, and you could just, they were free. You just grab the beer, they had the rock music playing, they had bands everywhere. It was like a big pep rally, and it was to celebrate, you know, every year. And I was brought in there, and I was given 20 minutes on stage, they had a big clock in the back of the room, in the ballroom. They had the Molson family, which was the, the board, the Coors family was a board, senior leadership and all the senior leaders behind them. I was on the stage and basically had 20 minutes to tell them that they're the worst performing beer company in the world financially. 
right? So I was the, I was the reigning on their parade. And the reason I was going to reign on their parade <clears throat> was because leadership was about to do some restructuring because they were getting pressure from Wall Street. They had Bloomberg terminals. They knew they had a negative spread. They wanted me to explain the concepts, just like I've explained it to you, about the doom that was coming, and then they'd give them the bad news. So <clears throat> we know the data. If you have a negative spread, what should you do about growth? Should you grow? That hurts you, right? We know that that's actually worse for you. So that would have been the logical conclusion. They knew this too. Like, all right, we need to cut back on the growth. We need to fix the business. We're probably going to do some layoffs and restructuring. That's why 30 of you may be gone. And you'll understand at least why you're losing your job and, and why we're doing all these prunings and things. And the Wall Street people are going to come in here and do some restructuring, yada, yada, yada. So long story short, I'm sitting up at the top of the stage. <clears throat> and this was the message I gave them. You guys are doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Don't slow down the growth. And I wasn't kidding. There was no joke here. I was dead serious. And the room at the West End was just as quiet at this point as the room here. Well, why? Well, <clears throat> before I went to Molson Coors, I realized that they had a lot of non-operating assets. Went through their balance sheet. And they had a giant joint venture with a company called, at the time, SAB Miller. <clears throat> and they put hundreds of millions of dollars into this joint venture. But that had nothing to do with selling beer, right? Because they didn't manage the joint venture, somebody else did. They just had this economic stake in it. So here's the point. This 5.44% ROIC is the return, not only on the beer business, it's the return of the joint venture and it's blended together. So what I did is I said, let's look at the operating ROIC, custom field you put in, to look at how well they're doing making beer. And this was the answer. 18%. Do you want to go slash and burn a business making 18% when you're borrowing at five? Do you want to go stop the growth of a business making 18% when you're making five? And I thought my responsibility was to tell them no. So even though the company is making 5%, 149 people in the room that actually make beer are making 18. Now, are they doing as well as their peers? No, their peers are actually making 27 yeah, they can improve, but I don't want to go gutting that business. It's actually going to hurt Molson Coors if they stop selling the 18% because if the business is making five and the operating is making 18, where's the problem? It's the non-operating investment. So that's the point. That's what's killing them. It's, it's the joint venture, not the beer business. And I'll tell you, this is extraordinarily common. This is why McKinsey wins out in the boardroom against the banks. Because the banks will come in there and they'll tell you, you're making 5%. You suck. You got to do something about this. And McKinsey's like, absolutely. But let's look a little deeper and let's figure out where your problem is operating, non-operating. That extra step gets you a lot more insight because here's a real company that's getting ready to whack with a machete the business making 18 because they're not thinking about it that way. They're just thinking about the pr pressure of the five. And this is what I mean by doing what we're doing now gives you more insight into a business than what a lot of people do. And this gets you a much better understanding of how the business world works. So it's extra work, but this is where the value can come from. Make sense? Questions? In fact, I'll give you an example of Apple. If we do the exact same template with Apple, This is why it's important to forecasting. Apple's ROIC, here is the spread, last year was 18.6%. So I want to forecast Apple. So I forecast them ROIC at 18%. But here's the thing. Apple's operating ROIC, when they sell iPhones and watches and things like that, iPads, is actually... 494%. Because basically, you're going to buy a $1,000 phone from Apple, and they're going to pay about $250 to Foxconn to make that phone. And Apple's not going to have any inventory. That's why you've ordered an advance from them last week, because they don't actually ship it to you until you pay them by credit card, and then Foxconn doesn't get paid by Apple 
until you told me you want an order. So Apple runs a $220 billion company with about $4 billion worth of inventory because they got Foxconn to take on all the investment. So they make a ridiculous ROIC when they sell their products. And that's the other thing. There's very little downside to Apple because if they don't sell the product, guess what? They don't have sales, but they didn't have any assets to begin with. Foxconn's the ones that's going to suffer. So if the iPhone 8 is a disaster, it'll be bad for Apple, but it won't be as disastrous because they didn't hire all the people and they didn't hire all the assets and they don't buy the iPhones unless you actually buy the iPhones. So that part that Tim Cook set up, because that's the genius of Tim Cook, he's Mr. Supply Chain, gets them a 500% ROIC. So what I'm telling you is when we go forecasting Apple, forecasting the couple hundred billion dollars worth of cash they have, and all of this together gets them to an 18.6%, which sounds great, but they're gonna make a lot more than 18.6% when they sell the next batch of iPhones. And that's when we get to forecasting how we'll change our forecast. It's not that we ignore the cash, we just separate it out. A lot of people would just forecast Apple at 18.6, and they're gonna miss the valuation because what they're going to do is they're going to keep forecasting as if Apple keeps adding cash to sell more phones. And they don't even realize they're making a mistake because this is what they learned how to do with their MBA program. So I'm going to teach you differently this semester. I'm not saying that you go work for your banks and tell them that they're wrong, but at least you'll have an appreciation for what they're doing and the shortcuts they're, they're taking. So back to this. That's what we're going to focus on. So let's start with the conversions. We're going to start with the balance sheet just arbitrarily because that was the way they laid it on the book. So here is PowerPoint, and here is the Excel file that I put in Elms that I said we would start with, the data file, just recreating what was in Excel. I'm going to recommend that we create a tab per statement this semester. So new tab, new worksheet, so it's easy to copy and paste, and it's also easier to grade and clean. So new tab. We're going to call this TFI, Total Funds Available to Investors. Make it a little bit bigger, easier to see, 200%. And relative references equals copy over, prior, current, and label. Okay. Now, the first step to this process is to make sure we have proper labels. And in this version of the file, I'd already give you the label, but I'm going to wipe these labels out. We're going to relabel. Because again, the labeling process will help us. So this is an extra step. Even McKinsey doesn't do this step, right? But I, I think you'll find this step to be helpful. So we need to label each of these items. One, operating. Two, non-operating. Three, debt, interest-bearing debt. Four, equity. What type of cash flow is it? So cash, what do you think? One or two? One or two? All right, it's a trick question. <laughs> For purposes of this example, it's a one, it's operating. But sometimes debt can be operating, or sorry, cash can be operating, sometimes cash can be non-operating. Example, as I told the previous classes, my first job in high school was working at Burger King, and I used to work the drive through at Burger King at 15 years old. Minimum wage, $3.35 an hour back then. So, <clears throat> long story short, uh, when I would come in for my shift, basically I'd go to the manager's office, the assistant manager would sit there and he'd have a till out of a safe with about $120 of cash in it, because this is kind of more of the pre-credit card days. So you buy stuff and pay with cash, you need to make change. So we'd count out the $120 worth of cash, and then he'd bring the till with me. We'd walk to the register. He'd take out the till. He'd put my till in. He'd reset the register. I'd do my shift. At the end of the shift, he'd then put in the next till, reset it, print out a piece of paper with all the transactions, and we'd go back with my till and the piece of paper back to his office, and we'd count $120 worth of cash. We'd leave it in, and everything about $120, we would take out of the register. Okay? So the $120 is what's called operating cash, and the rest of the money is called excess cash. And the point is, a business can't just take all of its cash and pay it out. There is some cash a business can never pay out operating cash. Think about the Burger King drive through If Burger King can't make change in its drive through it can't sell products. So I can't take the $120 out 
and use it to do whatever, pay a dividend, pay back a bank, because the money is going to be tied up into the business, operating cash. What can be paid out is the excess cash. So here's the point. You learned in a previous class a concept known as net debt. Net debt is debt minus cash. And the high, whole idea of net debt is you can take the cash and you can pay off all your debt immediately with it. Well, that's a fallacy. That can never happen in the real world, even though you were told it could, and even though people will use net debt as a ratio on Wall Street. Think about it logically. If a business were ever to go bankrupt in a bankruptcy court, who is the first to get paid? It's not the creditors. It's not the depositors. It's not the bondholders. It's the lawyers. And it's, it's a rigged system. They take care of their own. Like the judge will authorize payments to the lawyers before payments to anybody else. They get primacy once you go bankrupt. Then who's <laughs> going to get paid? Then employees. Basically, if employees work, you're paid one every once, once a month, every two weeks. The unpaid wages that you've given as an employee will get prioritized above the bondholders. The judge will pay the employees. Then they're going to pay the IRS. They're going to pay the unpaid taxes before the secured bondholders come in there, regardless of your security interest. And so that's the point, is that net debt is not what you're actually going to get as the bondholder or, or the bank. There will be people that will get paid in front of you. And so that's what I'm saying is that operating cash is actually going to be key here because we're never going to get all of the cash. Same thing. If a business is running day to day, it's got to have some cash to make payroll, to pay suppliers, to pay vendors. When General Motors a few years ago went bankrupt, they actually went bankrupt with over a month of cash on hand. But they said, as we got closer to a month of cash on hand, we're going to cease functioning as a global company because cash tied up in different countries and making payments. With, you can't run a business with one or two weeks. When I work with hospitals, they will tell me, two weeks of cash, hospital goes under. So zero is not the number. By the way, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to figure out how much of a cash balance is operating and how much is non-operating, because that's not a accounting thing. And the easiest way to do it, by the way, ask the company. You ask the treasurer or CFO of a company, and they know. They know how much cash they need, right? But you're not going to have that privilege this semester. So the book talks about several methods for estimating it. And one of the methods we're going to do, and this will start with your homework assignment on Monday, is basically we're going to assume 2% of revenue is operating cash. That was actually the custom field you put into Bloomberg. 2% of revenue is basically one week a year. We're going to say everybody needs at least a week of cash. Now, the reality is you probably need more than a week of cash right, to keep your business operating. All right, but nonetheless, we're going to say there's some baseline amount, and we're using 2% as revenue as a baseline in this class, just arbitrarily to recognize the notion of operating cash. Anything above that is excess cash. That's your discretionary cash, but the operating cash is like inventory it's tied up in the business. So in this example, McKinsey didn't break it out. They called it a one, but it could be a one or a two. Okay, does that make sense? All right, inventory. Operating, non-operating, one or two. Operating. Property, plant, and equipment. Operating, non-operating. Operating. Equity investments. Google puts a billion dollars into Lyft. Operating or non-operating? non-operating. That's the point. I have value in my investment. Google has value in a Lyft, but they're not running Lyft. Right? They're not running that business. It's an equity investment, non-operating asset. Right? We don't do the total accounts. Accounts payable. Operating or debt? Here's the question. Is it interest-bearing? Generally not, so therefore it's not debt. Debt is interest-bearing, so therefore it's an operating liability. One. There's the hint to the next one. Debt. Bank loans, bonds. One, two, three, or four. That's what we're calling the threes. That's the debt. 
Here's another question. It's not on here, but this will affect your homework assignment next week. <clears throat> Company has short-term debt or current portion of long-term debt. One, two, three, or four. Current portion of long-term debt. It's a current liability. What is it? One, two, three, or four. Why is it a one? Current portion of long-term debt? That does have interest. It's a three. This is what I said. This is where you're going to have to start to think through this stuff, and it's different than accounting. And if you don't read the book and you're like, oh, I'll just read Wikipedia, this is where it gets you into trouble. Because what you'll do is you do current assets minus current liabilities. But I just gave you two exceptions. Number one, excess cash. Excess cash we will pull out of current assets, and we will treat that as non-operating. Only operating cash stays part of current assets for our purposes of working capital. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to take any debt that is a current liability and we're going to call it debt. We don't care if it's short or long term. What we're going to say is debt is debt and debt is financing. So that's not part of current liabilities as it relates to working capital. Hence, we will have an operating working capital, which is different than the accounting definition of working capital, current assets minus current liabilities. That's the Medigliani Miller rearranged statements. Okay, so it's actually a three. Retained earnings. That's equity. That's the shareholder money. Okay, again, don't do the columns. Just while we're here, let's do the income statement. Revenue. Generally, revenue is operating. There can be the idea of non operating revenue. It's less common, and if it was, we'd break it out. For purposes of your homework and midterm, I'm not going to try and trick you, so revenue will be operating. Okay? But when you get to the second half of the semester, when you're dealing with real companies, different story, because then you're going to have to figure out if any of their revenue is non-operating, because the accounts might label it so. That's where you have to kind of look at the actual statements. But generally, revenue is operating. Operating costs. Cost of goods sold, sg &A. That's one. Depreciation. Well, let me ask you this. Where on the balance sheet did depreciation come from? PP&E. What did we call it on the balance sheet? One. So therefore, the corresponding item in the income statement should also be one. You got to have a consistency between the statement. So if depreciation comes from PP&E and PP&E is operating, then depreciation by definition also has to be operating. Okay. Now, I'm not going to let you take too many shortcuts, but here's one of them. When you do the rearranged income statement, you can actually start at operating profit. All right, so even though operating profit is the sum of everything above, because everything above is generally operating, rather than writing out a whole bunch of extra accounts, I'll let you start with operating profit when you do the income statement. All right, and I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to try and trick you. It'll work this way on homework assignments in the exam. In the real world, though, we're going to be careful. Because if they put something above operating profit or EBIT that's not operating, we have to take it out. Okay. Now, interest expense. One, two, three, or four? Three. Three. Because where does interest expense come from in the balance sheet? Debt, and debt was a three, so the interest expense would also be a three because it's a payment to those stakeholders. Equity income. It came, it's non-operating income because it came from the equity investment. So because it's a non-operating item on the balance sheet, it'd be a non-operating item on the income statement. So it's the non-operating payment for the equity investment, too. Okay. Again, this is where it'll get tricky. So for example, on your next homework assignment, you're going to see something called minority interest. You guys remember the minority interest from accounting? I know some accounting majors here. Yeah, what's minority interest? I'm sorry? 20 and 50. So if, if you own a big chunk of a company, but you don't control it, the company will absorb all of your investment as if they owned it all. But then they'll owe you a portion of the money, essentially a dividend, because they're going to pay taxes on it. They'll owe you a dividend for your portion of the amount that was absorbed. And that's called a minority payment to the minority shareholder. So the point is, <clears throat> is that is actually not common equity. It's not a four. It's actually a liability to another shareholder. So it's really a three. 
Matter of fact, under accounting rules, the GAAP people are revisiting this, and they're thinking about reclassifying minority interest as a liability for a similar type of a reason. They haven't done it yet, but it's one of the things under review by the GAAP body. So, or the, sorry, FASB. FASB's thinking about doing this. But, so long story short, <clears throat> um, that's not here. It'll come up on your assignment next week, but you got to think about who it goes to. All right, tax. One, two, or three. All right, again, it is a one, it's also a two, it can also be a three. So what we're going to do here, which is again different, is we're going to take the tax impact and we're going to spread it out to each of the areas. What are the impact of taxes and operations? What are the impact of tax and non-operating activities? What's the impact of tax on the debt cash flows? So we're going to actually split it out. Net income. Who's that belong to? That's a four. Equity. Common dividends. Who gets the common dividends? Shareholders. So therefore, four. So just as a preview, <coughs> this is your homework assignment for next week. A lot more categories, a lot more years. All right. The years are just meant to scare you because I could put 10 years on here versus three years and it doesn't matter. All right? Because once you've labeled it, it's copy and pasting and, and moving over the rows. So it doesn't take any more time if I add any more years. But that being said, you're going to have to figure out what is what across these various categories. And that's going to be key to success on your homework assignment. All right? And there's a lot more categories that haven't been talked about yet. All right. So back to this simple one. So now let's start the conversion. Start with the balance sheet, TFI. So again, process. We want all of our ones together and netted. Operating assets netted against the operating liabilities. So we look through what we just call the balance sheet, our ones, and we start netting them out. So equals, whoa, what's happened here? Escape, let's try this again. Equals. Data, start out with, oh, how's it doing that? Equals cash, and I'll copy and paste this across. All right, our next one should be inventory. Our next one should be net PP and A. All right, those are our asset ones. And then liabilities, accounts payable. And if I net all of these, I get something called, called operating working or operating invested capital. All right. In this class, we'll probably just call it invested capital, but I'm going to try and use where possible the word operating to signify our definition, the Medigliani Miller definition of operating capital versus what people would call invested capital in the real world, Bloomberg or other classes, because they're going to do it based on debt and equity because they're not going to separate out the non-operating <laughs> items. So again, we'll probably start calling it invested capital, but it's operating invested capital generally in this class. So what does that represent? Take our cash plus our inventory, plus our PP&E, subtract out the payables. So 380 and 440. That's the operating invested capital. Assets, net of liabilities. All right. We're going to do the same thing for the non-operating capital. So anything that's a non-operating asset, equity investment, anything that's a non-operating liability. In this simple example, they didn't have them. On your homework, you will. So just make sure that you put in the non-operating liabilities. And just like on the asset side, you net them together. So that would then get us our non-operating <coughs> capital. Since I have nothing to net, it is the equity investments. So what is 
what's called TFI, total funds available to investors, equals the operating invested capital plus the non-operating capital. That becomes the total funds that are invested. All right? Here's what I mean by balancing statements. The other side of the statement is called the financing or funds flow. So that's what we've invested. Let's look at the financing. It has to foot. So any debt, any three, I financed it with this amount of debt. And I financed those assets with this amount of equity. That's the equity, the fours. All my threes, all of my fours. There's only two of them, but put them all if there's more. And when I add up my threes and fours, the debt and the equity, the financing, this is what I mean by a balancing statement. 395 balances, 465 balances. This was the investment, this was the financing. They must be equal. Right? Now, let's say that you were being sloppy and you accidentally put equity investments here. Notice what happens? I have an unbalanced statement. This is what I mean. Even though 395 is the correct answer, you also have 240 on there, and you don't really know which one's right. This is what I mean by 50-50 probability. So you know one of the two is likely right, but you don't know which one. And even if you said, I think 395 is right, and I can't get it to balance, you still get a zero and no credit, because you can't really tell me with certainty that that's right. So guessing doesn't get credit. You must show that these balance. And here's where labeling helps you. All my ones are together. All of my twos are together. All of my threes are together. All of my fours are together. Where did I screw up? I put a two and a four section. This is why labels help you. Because when you put things in and you make a mistake and things don't balance, if you have a label, two things. One, count the numbers of twos. Count the numbers of threes. Do I have the same number of twos and threes on this statement as I did in my original statement? So that's where, did I forget something? The other thing is, Check the sections. Did I put the things in the right category? Because if I put in the wrong category, that will also cause the statement not to balance. So it helps you when you troubleshoot. Okay? So here, I'll undo. Now I have a balancing balance sheet, TFI. Questions about TFI? Okay? Statement number two, the income statement rearranged. TII. Create a new tab. We'll call it total income available to investors. Same process. I'll copy and paste just to make it easier. So equals data, prior, current, and label. All right. So now I need the same thing. Anything off the income statement that's operating is going to be to eventually create our no plat. So here's what I'm going to do. Equals, and I told you I could take a shortcut, start with operating profit. So this was our operating profit of 280, 280 million, which is a one. Now here's the thing. If I just reported 280 million to the IRS, my tax on my operating profit at the company's tax rate of, effective tax rate was 25% here. So at 25%, I would pay 25% in taxes. That would be the operating tax. And that would then get me my no plat. Which would be 210 million. That's no plat. Okay. Now, <clears throat> next... I will take my non-operating income after tax. So equals data tab, any twos? Well, the two here was the equity income. So I have four million of equity income. Tax on equity 
income equals the four times the 25 percent. I pay a million in tax, so my after tax equity income is three. Right. Now I want to highlight why I'm putting it this way because in the book, and a friend of mine's name is Dave Wessels. He's this, one of the authors on the sixth edition from McKinsey. We go back a long time ago. We we're both teaching the ATP program, analyst training program. And he actually was one of the editors for this section. And he was being a little lazy. And what I mean by a little lazy is in the solution file, he reported, as you can see on the screen, $3 million of after-tax non-operating income because he's been doing this for over 20 years and it's just so ingrained and intuitive to him that everything is after tax. So for him to do non-operating non income times one minus the tax rate, he just does this. He did this in Excel, he copied and pasted in the book. That was the, the, the thing that you see in the book. So what I'm telling you is the book shows you three is the answer, but they don't show you how they got to three. Like why is it four on the left and three on the right? Well, what I'm telling you is what's happening mechanically is the way I'm writing it out here. Now, if you're a super whiz kid and you don't need to, to put this extra line tax on equity income and you just know it's after tax and you multiply by, you know, equity income times one minus tax rate, great, do it. But even for people like me to see what's really going on, in these very complicated spreadsheets, write it out. As you're getting started, it will help you to do this level of granularity. So you'll want, you won't wonder later, like, why is it a three? All right. And more likely, you won't make a mistake. All right, because it's easy to make mistakes when you start taking shortcuts, especially if you don't know what's going on. So that's actually why it's three million, and hopefully it's a little bit more straightforward. So if I take my non-operating income, because if I have more of those, I would add them in, but I don't. That would be my three. And so my total income available to investors, TII, is the 210 plus the three. <clears throat> Questions about that? Now, format. This is not accounting. It's not generally accepted accounting principles. This is Medigliani Miller economic statements as created by McKinsey. So here's the idea. On this statement and on the CFI, if I have profit, the statement's at the balance, so the second half of the statement called the funds flow or financing flow is just a recording of where that 213 went. So I have to record where did I spend the 213 of profit that I made on the financing. And by the way, when I add those up, it has to equal exactly 213. Because if it doesn't, then I don't have a balancing statement. In order to do that, because I have profit and I then pay out the profits, on this other side of the statement, the financing flows, payouts are positive numbers. Okay. That's just the way the format of the statement is set up. So let's go back to the income statement. My first payout is to the interest expense, the threes. So I go back to the income statement and I look at any threes and I have interest expense of 20. Because I'm actually paying this interest expense out, it's a positive number. I have profit, therefore I can afford to pay out the interest expense. So it's a positive 20. All right? Yes? Well, we're about to do the tax. So what is the tax shield based on the interest expense? Well, we would have 20 of interest. We'd actually write off a quarter of it for the taxes. That would be the tax shield. So our after tax, after tax interest expense is 15. Is that, you see where that, that kind of works? So let's just be clear. How much tax did the company originally pay? We got the income statement. How much tax did the company pay in the income statement? 
What's the number? 66. Everybody see that? Okay. Let's make sure that we foot it here. On operating activities, how much tax did the company pay? 70, right? On non-operating activities, how much did the tax the company pay? 1. What's 70 plus 1? 71. How much did the company save on tax yields? What's 71 minus 5? 66. We still have the same taxes, but what we're doing is we're showing where the taxes are being impacted. So what we're saying is the company spent 70 in taxes on operating activities, spent 1 in taxes on non-operating activities, and it got 5 back from the government because it had debt in its capital structure in which it was able to write it off. So that's the impact of the tax yield, and we can clearly see that there's a $5 million cash flow impact because of the tax yield. That's the benefit of the tax rate. Now, if the government were to change the tax rate, we could quickly look at the impact of the value of changes in the tax rate. It's exactly what it, they did when they're projecting what the new tax rate's going to be if the Republicans get it closer to 20%. It's one of the reasons why the stock market's been up, right? Because people think it's actually going to happen. So long story short, this is why when we put it into this format, there's a much clearer understanding of what's going on with the business. Questions about that? All right. Our final one, we got the after-tax interest expense of 15. So now we have the net income, which is the last one off the income statement, of 198, which is the fours. Now, for purposes of TII, the total income available to investors is the rearranged income statement. It ends at net income. So dividends are not part of an income statement. Okay. So therefore, dividends are not on the TII. That ends with net income. But if I take my interest plus net income, 213, 213 balances to 213. This is the, the footing of the statement. So here's what I can say. This company generated 210 million of cash flow running its business, 3 million of cash flow through non-operating activities, having 213 available to distribute to investors. It gave 15 to the bondholders, and it gave 198 to the shareholders, and that's how the profit was allocated. That's the rearranged statement. Questions? Good. So you guys will be fine with this on your homework assignments. And I'm actually being serious. And based on past homework assignments, these two statements most people get. Statement number three is the one you're going to have trouble with. If you're like any other classes I've had in the past, about 20% of you will never get the, the CFI to balance and you'll get really frustrated. So the time to do the homework is usually either one hour or five hours or more and then people quit and give up. So I hope that you don't fall into that five hour or more give up on the next homework assignment category. So this is the statement that you're gonna have trouble with and it's called CFI. And CFI, so let's go back to our PowerPoint, cash flow available to investors is the third statement and I said you have to have the first two to do the third. So we're going to do the third. But what we're about to do is the same process four times. The process for cash flow is cash for the income statement minus change in the balance sheet. All right, and we're going to do that for each one of the sections. So just as long as you keep that in mind, it'll help it go through a little bit more quickly. So let's create CFI. Back to Excel. New tab. CFI. Make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Copy and paste titles so I have them. And let's start out. So operating cash flows first equals from the TII. What's my operating cash flow? It's my no plat. According to the book, on the free cash flows, it's no plat plus depreciation, so I need my depreciation. No plat plus depreciation gets me something called gross cash flow. 
That's how much cash, because depreciation is a non-cash item, that I generated off the income statement. Now I'm going to have to add no plat plus depreciation, and here's where common sense comes into play. And I don't know how to give you an answer because there is no always in this process because unfortunately companies and accounting firms will sometimes report numbers as positive and sometimes they'll report numbers as negative. And I can't always tell you that depreciation will be reported as a positive or a negative number. So here's the point. You know the, the equation. The equation is no plat plus depreciation. On this example, depreciation was reported as a negative number. All right, so if I just added negative 20 to negative 210, that wouldn't be my cash flow. My cash flow is adding back the non-cash item, so I would have to flip the sign. Equals 210 plus 20 equals 230. That's my gross cash flow. And this is what I mean by you're going to have to use common sense. Because if you don't think through the impact of the cash flow and put the appropriate sign, I can't tell you it's always going to be given to you in the right direction. So that's gross cash flow. All right, minus gross investment equals free cash flow. What is gross investment? <clears throat> gross investment, that was cash in the income statement. This is the change in the balance sheet. Gross investment equals from the TFI operating invested capital this year minus operating invested capital last year. Basically, it went from 380 to 440, so we spent more in the balance sheet. So it's the change in operating invested capital plus current year's depreciation, the 20. That is our gross investment. So change in invested capital minus, or sorry, plus depreciation. That is depreciation with an N. That is gross investment. Gross cash flow minus gross investment equals free cash flow. 230 minus 80, that's our operating free cash flow. Right? And in case you wonder why change in invested capital plus depreciation makes sense, it has to do with rearranging this formula. If we take our starting, this is CapEx. If we take our starting PP&E plus CapEx minus depreciation, we get our ending PP&E. That's just accounting. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. If we take CapEx equals end PPE minus start PPE just algebra plus depreciation. If we take changes in working capital plus CapEx, which is gross investment, that's where the plus depreciation carries through. Okay, so change in invested capital plus depreciation, it comes from the fact of the way the accounts handle the CapEx. So that's the shortcut, just so you know. All right, continuing on. Non-operating cash flows equals cash from the income statement, TII. That was our non-operating income after tax. That was our two. Then... We have change in the non-operating assets, so change in the equity investments. Equity investments went from 15, non-operating capital, 15 to 25. They went up by 10. Change in non-operating capital. All right. So this is our non-operating cash flow. And this is what I mean by you have to kind of think this through. All right, so the whole idea is we're trying to get the cash flow available to investors. This is the cash that we can pay out. If we make three million of non-operating income, does that add to the cash that we can pay out or does that take away from it? 
If we make $3 million of profit, does that add to what we can pay out or take away? It adds. So it needs to be a positive number. If I grow my non-operating investment in another firm by $10 million, does that add to the cash or take away? Takes away. So this is an outflow. And this is what I mean by you have to kind of think through what's happening if you're going to do this statement right. So my non-operating cash flow is $3 million of income, $10 million of investment, it's negative $7 million. So my CFI, the actual cash available to pay out, is the one fifty of free cash flow, $7 million of non-operating items that I invested in net, so I have 143 of cash to distribute to my investors. Here's the next tricky part. Debt and equity. This has got to balance. What are my payments? Well, my payments to, again, income statement, TII. How much did I give the bondholders or banks? That was my after-tax interest expense. I gave them 15. My change in debt. My change in debt, my debt went from 225 to 200, which means I basically paid off 25 of debt. If it's a payout, it's a positive number because I have cash available to distribute, format of the statement. So I got to flip the sign on that one. All right? This is where it gets tricky. I don't use net income as a payment from the income statement to a shareholder because net income is not what I gave to the shareholder. This is the cash flow statement. I needed net income to balance TII. What is the cash flow to a shareholder called? Dividends. So this is the trick. On the TII, it's net income to get the TII to balance. On the CFI, you don't use net income because net income is not the cash flow to the shareholder. Dividends is the cash flow to the shareholder. So you replace net income with dividends on this statement. So equals dividends. Because it was a positive, or sorry, because it was a payment to the shareholders, the payout is a positive number. Change in equity equals from TFI. The only equity is I had retained earnings. Retained earnings went from 265 to 170, right? So basically, it went up by 95. Cut, paste, forgot to do that. Retained earnings. This is a four. So again, this would be negative. Because that's an increase. So when I sum this up, those were the changes, I should get 143. If I don't get 143, I made a mistake. Well, maybe I actually didn't get 143, so in the interest of time, let me just quickly switch the sign. What did I do wrong? Yes. You did. And that's supposed to be right. That's paying off. But here's retained earnings. I made the sign positive. I made the sign negative. Neither one balance. Because here's the other trick. Retained earnings is a non-cash item. A change in a non-cash account does not affect cash flow. If you try and account for retained earnings of the CFI, it will never balance. That's the other trick. So, if you have non-cash items on your balance sheet, changes in non-cash items do not affect CFI. Net income is not the cash flow, dividends are. So we sub out dividends for net income on the CFI. We need net income to balance the income statement, so we use net income. But it's not the cash flow. Same thing, retained earnings is a non-cash account, so we ignore change of retained earnings, do the other accounts which are cash, and you will get a balancing CFI. That will be important to your homework assignment. Okay, so these are the three balancing statements. On Wednesday, as I said, Bloomberg's gonna be here again, but I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the economic statement and answering any questions for your next homework assignment, which will basically be convert three years of financial statements. Okay, and that is basically part one of your midterm exam, is convert financial statements. So this is coming up a lot in the next couple weeks. Okay, see everybody in 48 hours.
at the next class. Hold on one second. And I just...